want to die, death is a constant reminder here. We're people we kill, we in that. You ain't supposed to be alive. Killing, shooting people, doing whatever I had to do. We have to make a living. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I know how to grind. I started from the bottom. Never ride on your friends. Race to rackets. It's rough on a black man. Hold up, we're gonna pull this whole... See, I try to open everyone's eyes to the fact that Philly wasn't just JBM. We have the Italian Mafia, of course, the Irish Mafia, biker gangs. We already covered the Philly Asians. Tonight, we're covering the Puerto Ricans in the 80s. Luis Sexo Ortiz from North Philly. The ninth grade dropout became the head of the Great Tape Gang during his late teens, early 20s. Now, there isn't too many people that can say they was a boss and getting it at the age of 18, 19. I mean, that's how bad life sucks to have someone that's younger than you doing better than you on the streets, having a day way. The young poppy stepping out of the red Suzuki Samurai dressed in all white with gold all around his neck and wrist. With all of this going on, he still was under his mother's roof. Now, opportunity for Puerto Rican youth grew rapidly in Philly during the 1980s. A couple years earlier, states including PA passed new drug legislation mandating much harsher mandatory sentences for drug offenses. Drug dealers responded by recruiting juveniles from many of the tags which carried the greater risk of exposure. So we all know the younger you are, the less time you're going to get. They're not going to give a kid much time for drugs. You may get a, you know, get sent to a detention center and be back on the streets in no time. But Luis Ortiz, aka Sexo, was the name that the ladies gave him in the bedroom. He was the head of the Great Tape Gang. Now, they were called the Great Tape Gang because members of the organization would sell bags of coke sealed with great tape. Now you had the yellow tape gang, the black tape gang, turquoise, gold star tape gang, and Ortiz's gray tape gang was more dominant and sold more than the other colors, even though the police investigated that the colors were no different from each other. The streets thought the gray tape bags were the higher quality product. Now with that being said, Ortiz pretty much controlled the street prices. Now they all operated on Marshall and Tioga, which was called the OK Corral due to the consistent gunfights every night. OK Corral was even spray painted on a dumpster in that area. It even got to a point that street dealers were walking around with OK Corral on the back of their jackets. Now, and it was super wild in that area. And everyone was used to the gunshots. It was just like dog barks. It was nothing. And shit was jumping. Shit was moving like clockwork. They all had different color of tapes on the bag so their money wasn't mixed in with the other groups. So when the players came to cop, they would ask for a yellow tape or a black bag any color of choice. On the strip, you had the youngest screaming out they got butter, and some screaming out the prices of the bags. They were allegedly selling $1.5 million worth of coke each month as a whole. Now, according to the police, Luis Ortiz was a cold blood killer. At the age 19, he was charged of killing the 18-year-old leader of the Gold Star Bag Gang, Luis Colon. According to the police, Ortiz executed him in front of his pleading wife, Ortiz stepped over him and finished him with a chest shot. Ortiz was arrested, of course, and he made the $100,000 bail. And we're talking about a 19-year-old, people. It was a war going on as Ortiz used to supply the group with work. That summer alone, 60 people was already killed. Around the same time, Ortiz sold 18-year-old Richie Colon a motorcycle with bad bricks, causing Colon death from injuries of the accident. September 26, 1988, Ortiz was caught slipping the day after his 20th birthday. 33-year-old Adris Albaladejo got his lick back for his brother, Richie Colon. Shortly after, he was arrested in hell without bail. Now, Ortiz's death caused kids to riot, shoot guns in the air, flip cars over, set cars on fire, and loot stores. They actually burnt the store owned by the brother of Adris, and about two cars owned by their relatives were set to fire. During his funeral, Reporters that would be covering the news were even attacked. I mean, could you blame them? Like, where's the respect? But, you know, that's how Hispanics stick together. Um, they was really out there riding for that man. Ortiz's mother would bury him in Puerto Rico. And after all that was taken care of, his mother would take over his drug ring. His 42-year-old mother, Myrna Sotorin, and his 25-year-old brother, Moses Flash Sotorin, would get back to the business. Now, during that time, they would recruit blacks to help with the operation and still managed to bring in $100,000 a week. Now, by that time, the operation was already under investigation as investigators had Myrna Sutterin 
on video engaged in a drug deal while holding her grandchild. June of 1989, 32 members were indicted, including Myrna and Moses. The organization distributed as much as 50 kilograms of cocaine a year, using juveniles to sell the drugs. Sales often took place within close range of schoolyards. May of 1990, during Myrna trial, her son Moses came forward as a government witness, testifying against her after unsuccessfully trying to persuade her to plead guilty. He testified about how his mother had taken over the Grey Tape Gang after Luis's death in 1988. Now, when you hear stories like this, we act like we haven't heard the similar stories when a family member is snitching on another family member. At this point, you can't be surprised. While you're playing by the rules in the streets, the others are doing anything to survive. Now, Myrna Sarin was found guilty on several charges, including conspiracy, operating a continuing criminal enterprise, employing juveniles, distributing cocaine within a thousand feet of a school, and distributing cocaine. In September of 1990, Myrna Sarin was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. The son Moses received five years in prison. Now, luckily for Myrna, her life sentence got knocked down to 25 years due to the U.S. Sentencing Commission deeming her sentence to be overly harsh and expensive. She was released in November of 2015. The early release program saved taxpayers millions of dollars, given a $30,000 annual cost of a prison stay, compared to the $3,900 for supervised release. About 2,000 to 6,000 inmates were released and set to be deported. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, there's plenty more to cover. We're going to be all over the place this year. If you want the good content, we all have to work together. With me creating the content, all I'm asking y'all to do is like the videos and comment. You can just comment an emoji if you want. It takes less than a second. Shout out to the ones that do show support. And shout out to the upper echelon members. Everyone have a great weekend. I'm out.